For hundreds of years, people were already living and working in what we now call the Stonehenge landscape. They were building structures and monuments that would culminate in the large complex of stones and earthworks. The people building the Greater Curses, the Causewayed Enclosure and the Woodhenges were the ancestors of the builders of Stonehenge. They had the social organization necessary to come together to build significant earthworks and they had the resources to support the work as well as enough people to carry it out. The offerings that were found during excavations show the rich religious lives they had created. They were shaping the landscape in which Stonehenge was later built. My name is Kaylee and today we are going to take a closer look at Stonehenge and the surrounding landscape. Stonehenge is one of the most famous stone structures in the entire world. It's located on the Salisbury Plain in the county of Wiltshire in southwest England. The Salisbury Plain is most famous for its rich archaeology. It's a chalk plateau which formed during the Cretaceous period, which lasted from approximately 145 million years ago until about 66 million years ago. The plateau covers an area of about 780 square kilometers. The Stonehenge landscape is property of the National Trust. The estate covers about 850 hectares surrounding Stonehenge and it contains more than 400 ancient monuments. So first we will take a look at some of the monuments surrounding Stonehenge. Archaeologists have found four large post holes from the Mesolithic period, dating from around 8000 BCE. These holes under the old car park held pine posts from 0.75 meters in diameter, which were erected and eventually rotted in their place. Three of the posts were in an east-west alignment, which may have had ritual significance. Between 3630 and 3375 BCE, the Neolithic inhabitants built the Stonehenge Cursus just 700 meters north of current Stonehenge. This Cursus is approximately 3 kilometers long and it's about 100 meters wide, although it widens to about 150 meters near the western end. It's in an east-west alignment and it's oriented towards the spring and autumn equinoxes. On the east side there is a large Neolithic long barrow that's been constructed inside the Cursus and on the western side there's a Bronze Age round barrow. Unfortunately the large Neolithic long barrow has since been leveled and is now under an equestrian trail. Around this time the Salisbury Plain was still wooded but around 3600 BCE the Neolithic farmers started to clear the trees and develop the land. 750 meters northwest of the western end of the Stonehenge Cursus lies what's known as the Lesser Cursus. It's 400 meters long and 60 meters wide. The banks and ditches of this Cursus had survived into the 20th century, but unfortunately after World War II it's since been leveled due to plowing of the land and it's only visible as a crop mark. During excavations in 1983 as part of the Stonehenge Environs project, they discovered several red deer antler picks that have dated the monument to around 3000 BCE. Around 1.4 kilometers to the southeast of Stonehenge lies Coneybury Henge. Discovered from the air in the 1920s, the aerial photographs gave strong indication that it was a henge monument. The photographs show an oval ditch of 45 by 55 meters in diameter and the entrance is on the northeast side. It was excavated in 1980 which revealed a broad ditch of 4 meters wide and 3 meters deep surrounding the henge. The internal features include a few pits, numerous stake holes and an arc of post holes which may have represented a post circle. Some of the internal features predate the henge itself. The finds made during excavations include pottery from the early Neolithic up to the Bronze Age and numerous animal bones and cremated human remains. Just 12 meters northwest of Coneybury Henge, the excavators found a pit with a large amount of early Neolithic pottery as well as a large quantity of animal bones. The bones include at least 10 cattle, presumably cows, several roe deer, two red deer and a pig. 
The material from this pit was radiocarbon dated to between 3980 and 3708 BCE. The contents may represent the remains of a large feast predating the Henge Monument. The Stonehenge Avenue was discovered in the 18th century. It's nearly 3 kilometers long and it connects right through the stones of Stonehenge. An ancient avenue is defined by a long parallel sided strip of land with edges marked by stone or timber alignments or a low earth bank or ditch, usually measuring about 30 meters in width and open at both ends. This avenue was built between 2600 and 1700 BCE. In 2009, researchers discovered a ring of pits near the eastern side of the avenue close to the river bank. This ring of pits is often referred to as Blue Stonehenge. However, no monoliths were ever found, and the stone chips believed to be of blue stones were found to bear no relation to the blue stones of Stonehenge. In 2013, a section of the A344 road was closed, which had cut through the avenue close to Stonehenge. After the surface of the road was removed, it was shown that although the banks were sliced off, the filled-in ditches were still evident. They demonstrated that the avenue had indeed connected the River Avon right through to the stones of Stonehenge. In 2017, excavators discovered a causeway enclosure near Lark Hill, just three kilometers northeast of Stonehenge. The remains found at Lark Hill were unearthed during excavations ahead of constructions of new army service family accommodation. The dig at Lark Hill has found remains of a Neolithic enclosure, a major ceremonial gathering place approximately 200 meters in diameter. Radiocarbon dates of 3650 BCE have been found at this site. There are 70 enclosures of this type across England, but this is only the second one found in the Stonehenge landscape. The other being Robin Hood's Ball, which is only 4 kilometers to the northwest of Stonehenge and borders the Stonehenge landscape. These enclosures were used as temporary settlements, ceremonial gathering places, to manage and exchange animals, for ritual activity and disposal of the dead by exposure. The Lark Hill Causeway enclosure is about 700 years older than Stonehenge and it used to be part of a landscape filled with curses monuments and long barrows. Artifacts found during excavations include numerous pieces of Neolithic and Bronze Age pottery, hundreds of pieces of struck flint and cores, and a number of really well-preserved leaf-shaped arrowheads. Three kilometers northeast of Stonehenge lies Woodhenge, a Neolithic timber circle. It was identified by an aerial photograph in 1926, although it had been previously discovered in the early 19th century. It was thought to be a disc barrow, until excavations in 1926 and 1929 discovered that it was indeed a henge monument. During excavations, they found grooved ware pottery, dating the timber structure to the Middle Neolithic. They found shirts of beaker culture pottery as well, thus showing that this monument was in use for quite some time. While construction of the timber circle predates the ditch of the monument, the ditch itself had been dated to be constructed around 2470 and 2000 BCE, making the ditch a Bronze Age feature of this monument. Radiocarbon dating has showed that the monument had still been in use in 1800 BCE. Woodhenge consists of six concentric circles of post holes, the outer ring being 43 by 40 meters wide. The ditch surrounding the outer ring is 2.4 meters deep and about 12 meters wide. The outer bank surrounding the ditch is about 10 meters wide and 1 meter high. Including the bank and the ditch, the overall diameter is about 110 meters. Woodhenge had a single entrance to the northeast. At the center of the circle, they had found an inhumation of a crouched child of which the skull was split. The remains had been taken to London for further investigation but unfortunately, it got destroyed during the Blitz, making further investigation impossible. Excavations in 2006 indicate that there were at least five standing stones arranged in a cove on the site. The positions of all the post holes are currently marked with concrete posts, which is a simple and effective method of displaying the site and its complexity. 
Just north of Woodhenge are the Durrington Walls, which was the site of a large Neolithic settlement and a later Henge monument, and it's also the site of the latest discovery. Excavations led by a team of the University of Sheffield revealed seven houses in 2004 and 2006. It has been suggested that the settlement may have include up to a thousand houses, housing approximately 4,000 inhabitants. The site had been inhabited for approximately 500 years, somewhere between 2800 and 2100 BCE. What visibly remains of the Durrington Walls today is the wall of the Henge Monument, the eroded remains of the inner slope of the bank and the outer slope of the internal ditch. This now appears as a ridge surrounding a central basin. Originally, the ditch was about 5.5 meters deep and 7 meters wide at the bottom and 18 meters wide at the top. The bank was in some areas up to 30 meters wide. There were two entrances, one to the northwestern side and one to the southeastern side. The henge enclosed several timber circles, which were built around 2600 BCE, of which the largest is now known as the southern circle. This circle was oriented southeast, towards the sunrise of the midwinter solstice. A paved avenue was constructed on a slightly different alignment, towards the sunset on the summer solstice, and it led to the river Avon. The Henge sits on high ground, which slopes southeast towards a bend in the river. The southeastern entrance is approximately 60 meters away from the riverbank. Seven Neolithic house floors have been found next to and under the eastern bank of the Henge. Since some of these floors were located underneath the Henge bank, it has been suggested that the settlement came first and the Henge monument was constructed later. The density of some of the houses suggests that there are many more to be found in the field up north and in the fields to the east of the monument along the river bank. One of the homes excavated showed similarities to the Neolithic houses found at Scarabray in Orkney. I have made a video about Scarabray in the past, so I'll put a card in the upper right corner. In 2020, researchers from the University of St. Andrews, Birmingham, Warwick, Glasgow and the University of Wales Trinity St. David announced the discovery of Britain's largest prehistoric monument at the site. A consortium of archaeologists led by the University of Bradford made the discovery of a massive 2 km wide ring of prehistoric shafts up to 10 meters across and 5 meters deep. It surrounds the southern henge at Durrington Walls and the structures are dated to approximately 2500 BCE. Professor Vince Gaffney said that it was extraordinary that such a remarkable find has been made so close to Stonehenge. He said, the area around Stonehenge is amongst the most studied archaeological landscapes on Earth and it's remarkable that the application of new technology can still lead to the discovery of such a massive prehistoric structure, which currently is significantly larger than any comparative prehistoric monuments that we know of in Britain. When these pits were first noted, it was thought they might be natural features, solution hollows in the chalk. Only when the larger picture emerged, through the geophysical surveys undertaken as part of the Stonehenge Hidden Landscape project, could we join the dots and see there was a pattern on a massive scale. The pits average a distance of 864 meters from the center of Durrington Walls. The Lark Hill Causeway enclosure sits right on this circular boundary. It is unfortunate that the areas to the west and east of Durrington Walls have been developed, making further investigation virtually impossible. The opportunities to survey the areas and to confirm whether the north and south arcs are components of a single larger structure centered around Durrington Walls is therefore limited. And we finally reach that point of the video in which we will discuss Stonehenge. Stonehenge the monument was built in multiple phases and stages. These are as follows. Stonehenge 1 is followed by Stonehenge 2, and Stonehenge 2 is followed by Stonehenge 3. Stonehenge 3 is then built in five stages, stages 1 to 5. All these phases and stages took approximately 1500 years to eventually have created the monument that we see today. 
Stonehenge has multiple trilithons in its structure. A triliton or a trilith is a structure containing of two vertical stones with a lintel stone laying on top of it. Trilithons are found in many places across the planet, including Egypt, Malta, the Netherlands and even the archipelago of Tonga in Polynesia. Archaeologists define a henge as an earthwork consisting of a large banked enclosure with an internal ditch. Due to that standard, Stonehenge is not truly a henge monument because the bank is inside the ditch instead of the other way around. The earliest monument was constructed around 3100 BCE and it's called Stonehenge I. It consisted of a circular bank and ditch enclosure made of Cretaceous C4 chalk. It measured approximately 110 meters in diameter with a large entrance to the northeast and a smaller entrance to the south. The builders placed bones of deer and oxen and some flint tools in the bottom of the ditch. Inside the bank is a circle of 56 pits, each measuring to about 1 meters in diameter. This circle is known as the Aubrey Holes after John Aubrey, the 17th century antiquarian who first identified them. These pits, the bank and the ditch are known as the palisade or gate ditch. In a recent investigation, it was suggested that the Aubrey holes may have been used to erect a circle of bluestones. If this is the case, it would advance the monument's first erection of stones by 500 years. Evidence of Stonehenge II is no longer visible. The post holes that form some kind of timber structure were constructed around 3000 BCE. These post holes were smaller than the Aubrey holes, measuring to about 0.4 meters in diameter, and they were placed much less regularly. 25 of the Aubrey holes were changed to become burial sites during this time. In 2013, a team of archaeologists excavated the cremated bone fragments of 63 individuals buried at Stonehenge. Physical and chemical analysis of these remains has shown that these bone fragments were almost equally men and women, and included some children. The underlying chalk beneath the graves had been crushed by substantial weight, and the team concluded that the first bluestones brought from Wales were used as grave markers. Radiocarbon dating of the remains has dated these bones to be buried around 3000 BCE. In a 2018 study, it was found that many of the individuals that were buried around the construction of Stonehenge had most likely come from near the source of the bluestones in Wales and had not extensively lived in the area of Stonehenge. 30 cremations had been placed in the enclosure's ditch and the eastern half of the monument. Stonehenge is therefore thought to have functioned as an enclosed cremation cemetery, the earliest known cremation cemetery of this kind in the British Isles. Around 2600 BCE, the builders of Stonehenge abandoned the use of timber in favour of stone, and this is how the third phase of Stonehenge started. In the first stage of phase 3, they dug two concentric circles of holes in the centre of the site. The holes, known as Q and R holes, held up to 80 standing stones, of which 43 can be traced today. It is thought that the blue stones were transported from 240 kilometers away near modern-day Pembrokeshire in Wales. In a 2019 publication, it was announced that evidence of megalithic quarrying had been found at quarries in Wales that were identified as a source of the Stonehenge blue stones. This indicated that the blue stones were quarried by men and not transported by glacial action as one theory states. In that theory, the blue stones were thought to have been brought much closer to the site as glacial erratics by the Irish Sea Glacier, although there is no evidence of glacial deposition in southern central England. The stones that weigh approximately two tons could have been moved by placing them on rows of poles each monolith is about 2 meters in height, between 1 and 1.5 meters wide and 0.8 meters thick. The altar stone originated almost certainly from the Senny Beds in Brecon Beacon in Wales. At this time, the northeastern entrance was widened, precisely matching the direction of the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset. This phase of the monument was abandoned in an unfinished state. However, the small standing stones were removed and the Q and R holes were purposefully filled. 
Two large portal stones were set up just inside the northeastern entrance, of which only one remains. It's known as the Fallen Slaughter Stone and it's 4.6 meters long. The Stonehenge Avenue was constructed during this time, connecting the river with Stonehenge. During the second stage of Stonehenge III, which was dated to be between 2600 and 2400 BCE, the builders brought in 30 enormous sarsen stones. These stones may have come from a quarry near Marlborough Downs, or they may have come from the Chalk Downs, which was closer. These stones were fashioned with mortise and tenon joints before they were erected as a circle of standing stones, 33 meters in diameter. A mortise and tenon joint connects two pieces, one with a mortise hole and the other with a tenon tongue. The erected standing stones had a ring of 30 lintel stones resting on top of them. These lintels were fitted together with tongue and groove joints, which is the same joint we still use in modern times when laying a parquet floor. The lintels are each 3.2 meters long, 1 meter wide and 0.8 meters thick. Each standing sarsen stone was about 4.1 meters high and 2.1 meters wide and they weighed up to 25 tons. The tops of the lintels are about 4.9 meters above ground. Each standing stone had clearly been worked, being wider at the top and smaller at the bottom. The lintel stones curved slightly to continue the circular appearance of the monument. The inward facing surfaces of the stones are smoother than the outer surfaces and the average distance between the stones is one meter. A total of 75 stones would have been needed to complete the circle. It was thought that the circle might have been deliberately left incomplete, but during an exceptionally dry summer in 2013, it was revealed that patches of parched grass, which correspond to the location of the removed stones. Within this circle stood five trilitons arranged in a horseshoe shape 13.7 meters across with the open end facing northeast towards the entrance. These huge stones weighed up to 50 tons each, 10 upright and 5 lintels. They were arranged symmetrically, with the smallest pair of trilitons near the open end being 6 meters tall. The pair next to it was a little higher, and the largest single triliton would have stood at 7.3 meters tall. During the third stage, the blue stones were re-erected, and placed within the outer sarsen circle and may have been worked in some way. The third stage was constructed between 2400 and 2280 BCE. A few of these blue stones have cuts in them, suggesting that they may have been linked with lintels as part of a larger structure. The heel stone may have been placed during this time outside the northeastern entrance. It can't be accurately dated and may have been placed at any time during the third phase of Stonehenge. The heel stone used to be accompanied by a second stone, but that's no longer visible. Four station stones were placed around the site, of which two stood atop mounds, but these mounds never held any burials. Around the heel stone and station stones, they dug ditches and created banks. In the fourth stage, the blue stones were further rearranged between the two circles of sarsen stones and in an oval shape in the center of the inner ring. This fourth stage was between 2080 and 1930 BCE. Some archaeologists have argued that these blue stones were from a different place in Wales. These blue stones were set upright without lintels, and the altar stone may have been moved within the oval and re-erected. However, the fourth stage of Stonehenge wasn't as well built as the other stages, and the blue stones that were newly erected weren't founded well and began to fall over. Soon after, the northeastern section of the fourth phase of blue stones were removed, creating another horseshoe shape, which mirrored the shape of the central sars and trilitons. This was the fifth stage, and there were no further changes made between 1930 BCE and 1600 BCE. In 1600 BCE, two rings of concentric circles were dug around the outside of the Sarsen circle. These pits are known as Y and Z holes, and this was the last known construction of Stonehenge.
The last usage of Stonehenge was probably during the Iron Age, although Roman coins and medieval artifacts have been found in and around the monument. It is however unknown if Stonehenge was used continuously over the centuries or that it was left abandoned multiple times. We do know about the massive Iron Age hill fort known as Vespasian's Camp, which was built in 500 BCE alongside the Stonehenge Avenue near the River Avon. Stonehenge may have been a monument with multiple purposes. Some were funerary in nature because of the cremated remains that were found. Another purpose could have been a celestial observatory, which might have allowed the prediction of eclipses, solstices, equinoxes and other celestial events important to a contemporary religion of that time. Researchers from the Royal College of Art in London discovered that the blue stones possess unusual acoustic properties. When these stones are struck, they respond with a loud clanging noise. The blue stones were quarried near a town in Wales, which name means ringing rock, where the local blue stones were used as church bells until the 18th century AD. In certain ancient cultures, it was believed that rocks that ring out contained certain mystic or healing powers. Archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson speculates that the domain of the living was in and near Durrington Walls, and Stonehenge represented the land of the dead, with the River Avon serving as the connection between the land of the living and the domain of the dead. When an inhabitant passed away, they would make the journey to the afterlife by being brought through the avenue in Durrington Walls to be transported over the River Avon and then taken through the Stonehenge Avenue to the Stones of Stonehenge for their burial ceremony. Cecil Chubb was the last private owner of Stonehenge and he donated the site to the government in 1918. By 1928 the land around the monument had been purchased and given to the National Trust to be preserved. The buildings were removed and the land returned to agriculture, although the roads were left. Between 1972 and 1984, Stonehenge was the site of the Stonehenge Free Festival. On June 1, 1985, the Wiltshire Police prevented a convoy of several hundred New Age travelers from setting up the Stonehenge Free Festival. The police were enforcing a High Court injunction obtained by the authorities prohibiting the 1985 festival from taking place. This resulted in the Battle of the Beanfield, which took place over several hours. The use of this site for a festival was stopped after this, and ritual use of Stonehenge is now heavily restricted. When Stonehenge was first opened to the public, visitors were allowed to walk among, touch and even climb the stones. But in 1977, the stones were roped off as a result of serious erosion. Visitors are no longer permitted to touch the stones, but they are allowed to walk around Stonehenge from a small distance. English Heritage does allow access to the stones on the summer and winter solstice and the spring and autumn equinoxes. Visitors can make special bookings to access the stones throughout the year. Nearly one million people visit Stonehenge each year, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1986. I'd like to talk briefly about the plans to construct a tunnel through the Stonehenge landscape. The monument became affected by the proximity of two roads on either side, the A344 to the north and the A303 to the south. Plans to upgrade the A303 and close the A344 have been considered since the monument became a World Heritage Site in 1986. However, the controversy surrounding the expensive rerouting of the roads have led to the plan being abandoned many times. On May 13, 2009, the government gave approval of the construction for a visitor center. On the 23rd of June 2013, the A344 was closed and work began to remove the section of the road, which was then replaced by grass. 
The visitor center, which was designed by Denton Corker Marshall, was opened to the public on December 18, 2013. In 2017, the go-ahead was given by the government to construct a tunnel through the Stonehenge landscape to upgrade the A303. But leading archaeologists say that the £1.6 billion plan to build a road tunnel should be scrapped altogether. Especially after this latest sensational discovery. The new technology has the potential to reveal so much more because only a fraction of the area has been explored. While Highways England have argued that its plan to improve the A303 will cut congestion, the lead archaeologists say that there will be continuous traffic jams for the entire length of construction, which will take between 5 and 7 years. And they are highly concerned that the vibrations during construction will have an actual impact on the archaeological deposits causing the ground to crack. The government is expected to make a planning decision on July 17, 2020. Archaeologists around the world are horrified at what's going on and hope the government will not go along with the current plans. As Vincent Gaffney of the University of Bradford states, in a World Heritage Site as complex as Stonehenge, it is essential that we take sensitive decisions with respect to the best evidence we have, as future generations are unlikely to forgive us if we damage this unique landscape. The only thing us history buffs can do is hope that the government will not go along with these plans. I honestly think this video should not be any longer. And I will definitely make a follow-up video in the future about the monuments I have not discussed in this video. But for now, if you enjoyed watching, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you like to see more of these kind of videos and click the bell icon for notifications every time I upload. If you haven't watched my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner and I'll leave a link in the description down below. And for now, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.